Okay, this is What is a Civilization? Lecture for Unit 1.2 for Civilizations for World History 1. So uh, we talk about the process of a civilization beginning to emerge or grow, um, uh, just like we would talk about maybe like the growth of a plant or the growth of... Um, Oh, um, you know, even some of the things when we talk about how animals grow up, you know, from, from being small to becoming a fully fledged adult. So um, humans feel that um, the base of all civilization um, begins in the Paleolithic, in our hunting and gathering groups that we talked about before, and they have a simple shared culture, okay? Then once you have the Neolithic Revolution, and that's what we looked at in the lab, human groups become larger. Uh, the population increases. They live in villages, towns, and eventually what we call urban centers or cities. So what happens is as that population increases and as you have those urban cities that are there and they begin interacting with one another, they become linked. And this, at this point, historians and archaeologists say, okay, well, now culture is becoming more complex. It's becoming more elaborate. You have these groups that are um, linked economically or politically, and so they're exchanging ideas and beliefs and um, clothing styles and um, viewpoints. Uh, and that leads to a complexity that's beyond a simple group. So historians say that's where you have civilization. That's where civilization begins, as those urban centers and towns link. So your book defines civilization um, pretty simply. It's a complex culture in which large numbers of human beings share common elements. So you have to have complexity, right? Uh, you have large numbers, which typically means a high population and you share common elements. Um, and the, those common elements are sometimes called the characteristics of civilization. So don't use this as a checklist. Um, what, one of the things we're gonna look at as we go through the year and say is, you know, uh, what does the variation uh, look like in this place? What does, what does civilization look like here? What does it look like here? Um, and make comparisons so that we can understand human experiences as a whole, um, knowing that it's not going to be the same in every region of the world. So cities and urban centers, you have to have that. Government, okay, is the next thing. Religion, okay. Social structure. Writing. Monumental art and architecture. Of all of these, writing is the most controversial because not all civilizations develop them, writing. Um, and in some cases, people will be like, oh, well, you don't have writing, then you're not really a civilization, and so therefore you don't count. Um, and we don't want to be taking that attitude. What we want to do is look at, you know, some people prefer, instead of writing, they prefer record keeping. So how does people maintain records? And that can be maintained through writing, or it can be maintained through oral tradition, or it can be maintained with um, the Inca use something that they call the kipu, which is knotted strings and cords in which they recorded data and information. So you've got this, these different cities, okay, and, and the population is rising. So they produce a lot of food. That's what a surplus is. There's more food than people can eat. So they have lots of extra, which tends to lead to a healthier population. Um, they can, you can have more children because there's plenty of food for everyone to eat. Um, the villages, the towns become major urban centers, major, major cities. Um, I don't know if you remember, this is Shadowhuyuk over here on the right. Urban centers need to be able to maintain the food supply. Once you have a population that's dependent upon a certain amount of food, you need to make sure that that food carries through. And so that means doing things like irrigation and overseeing um, crop rotation, um, overseeing the collection and distribution or the collection and um, saving of crops long term um, over seasons that are fallow, like winter. 
you have to manage human behavior. Once people start um, living together in close quarters, um, human behavior becomes more of a problem. So in a small group, lots of things can be resolved, not always easily, but um, more collectively. When you're living in a town or a city, you need law and order. You need um, guidelines. You need uh, a sense of what's right and what's wrong. Uh, and so that's where people start to look towards some kind of organization that's going to handle that government. Um, people need to be able to defend themselves. Once you have resources, you become a target for people who want those resources. So um, another way that government begins to form is that a town or a city wants to defend itself and somebody needs to be in charge of that defense. So in general, early governments form to take care of at least one of these and usually more than one of those things. So when leadership and religion form, um, we typically see early leaders as warriors, but sometimes they were priests. Most of the early civilizations likely started off as theocracies which is where religion is government. So the religious law is government. The religious leaders are the leaders of the actual city instead of just religion. Um, over time, however, what we think happened is that defense and military became more important. Um, and so individuals um, began to take over government and that they became the first monarchs, kings, emperors, princes. One of the things that early monarchs did so that they could pass power on to their children and maintain power so someone else didn't come along and say, you know, I'm bigger and better, make me king, um, is that they claimed to be divine or they claimed to be the sons of gods. They, they used religion as a way to support their position. This is where, for many civilizations, writing or some form of record keeping starts to happen. Once you have a government or a religion, you need to keep track of things. And so in a number of places, we see that writing develops because you need to keep track of things. Sorry, alarm went off. Society and trade develop um, in response to growing population. So food surpluses um, will now impact society as well as the need for government and higher population. So if you've got a lot of food, if you have extra food, then not everybody is, needs to be a farmer. Once um, people don't need to be a farmer, they work specialized jobs. And those are jobs that um, require training in a, in a specific skill. So a person who makes jewelry um, or a person who makes weapons those are artisans, that's a specialized job. Uh, scribes, people who know how to write or know how to record the records, that's a specialized job. Um, but technically a monarch and a priest are also specialized jobs. Most early societies appear to have based um, social classes on jobs and what a person owns. So uh, certain jobs um, were considered more important than others, and so those people were more important in society. Um, yeah, in addition, some people ended up with more belongings, more resources than others, and that also began to influence um, how th their status in society. The artisans, so our jewelry makers, our weaponsmiths, our potteries, they begin to, the potters, they begin to supply special goods to the elite, to the government, to the leader, um, and that can include religious leaders. So priests, um, who are head priests, often enjoy a very, very high status, um, along with the monarch and other people who are considered now noble. Uh, the other thing that happens is people are no longer moving wild, widely. You're stuck in one place. So if you remember uh, the uh, river activity you did, once you pick a spot, you're building a permanent home. So it's not easy to simply get up and move. If you need resources, then you might go up and down that river looking for, for a place that has that, those resources that would be willing to trade with you. Uh, and that's essentially what happened. Monumental architecture is one of the last pieces. Um, 
But so once you have a large population, once you have people who have specialized jobs, who look at things like engineering and building and construction, once you have either important government or religious leaders, so essentially you have to have the labor force, the educated people who can oversee the design, and the leaders who can direct all of that to take place, you begin to see monumental architecture. So um, the picture is a picture of aqueducts, which moves water in Roman empires. Um, pyramids are also an excellent example of monumental architecture. Other things that are included, um, public works, and that essentially are roads, um, anything that's built for public use, uh, fountains, um, uh, drainage systems, um, there's something we call urban planning, which basically means you sit and you design a city. So anything that's part of how you make a city work. Um, and that's also, it overlaps really well with public works. So um, if they're designing it specific to a city and how the city is being laid out and what buildings they have in that city, um, how they get water into the city and sewage out, those kinds of things are all urban planning. And then, of course, temples, tombs, and other buildings that tend to be impressive if they take a lot of labor, if they cause a lot of resources, if they appear to be significant in the culture. Any or all of those things indicate monumental architecture. Right? And, and um, uh, almost all civilizations have some sort of monumental architecture. Thanks for watching.